It is a tribal name for a culture, not a job description. But on Everest expeditions, there's no question that Sherpas carry most of the burden. On a typical expedition, the Sherpas do all the heavy lifting. So you get to base camp, and your base camp is set up. Your tents are set up. Someone is walking out and handing you tea. Base camp tents are pitched on the rocky moraine of the Kumbu Glacier. And a dozen expeditions, over 300 climbers and Sherpas, will make this home for the next two months. Hanging just above the tent city is their first obstacle, the Kumbu Icefall. It's a frozen river of crevasses and shifting ice blocks and is one of the most dangerous parts of the climb. It's two weeks into the expedition, and the Sherpa team is assembled. Eight climbing Sherpas, six cooks, and five base camp staff. My name is Kami Sherpa. My name is Dawa Sherpa. My name is Lapa Gelzi Sherpa. My name is Zhang Lima Sherpa. My name is Dazong Bu Sherpa. I've been two times Ibris, four times Ibris. The first time is 1988. This is the second time to the Everest. I am one time summit Everest. 95 and 96 and also 97. I try to summit this time. I have confidence that this year I'll be able to uh, step on this great mountain. One of the Sherpas on the team, Dawa, will try to reach the summit of Everest for the first time. Like other Sherpas, he reveres the mountain as the dwelling place of a deity. For me and for my community, for all Sherpas, this is real God. We have lots of respect for this mountain. I hope the great Mother Goddess let me stand once on top of it. John Ling Tenzing Norgay will be supporting the expedition at base camp. He climbed Everest in 1996 when 15 people died on the mountain and then promised his family he would never climb it again. To his culture, the mountain isn't just rock and ice. It's the home of Chomolongma, the mother goddess of the world. Before facing the perils of the mountain, the Sherpas and climbers show their respect by offering barley flour to the goddess. There's so much danger on the mountain, but they believe in the Chomolongma, you know, the mother goddess Everest. They perform religious ceremonies, they pray, they light juniper before they head up the mountain. What we say is walking into the lap of the mother. I have been to Everest six times. The difficulty is always the same. We have to carry loads. We also have to think about rest. We always consult with the lamas and have them pray for us, for protection, so nothing happens to us. Why do Sherpas climb? For money. You have to take risk to earn it. the coffee. It's four o'clock in the morning, and this is our first time into the ice fall. And this is going to become a ritual as we get up at base camp and, and head up the ice fall. How are the Oreos, Brent? Well, I'm starting on cheese, <laughs> and then I'll move to Oreos, and then to Snickers. 
And then I should be sufficiently fired up. Four in the morning is way too bloody early. <laughs> <laughs> this will probably be opening day. There are about 10 or 11 expeditions. So my guess is we're going to see upwards of 100 people moving through the ice fall. Ah, good morning, Peter. Good morning, Dawan. Good morning. Hey, good morning. <laughs> oh, no coffee. Oh, sorry, I lose it. Sherpa breakfast is a high-energy bomb called sampa, barley flour mixed with yak butter. of ice there five six stories high and they do fall over quite regularly and you've just got to hope that you're not there when it happens if the ice fall decides to shift and big blocks fall over you're going to get killed when british climbers first set eyes on the kungu ice fall they declared it impassable In 1951, they made an attempt, but failed to get through, stopped short by a huge crevasse at the top. They would have to try again the following year, if they could get a permit. Today, an unlimited number of Everest permits are granted, but back then, Nepal issued only two permits per year, and in 1952, the British got a nasty surprise. Well, the wily old Swiss strapped them there and grabbed not just one, but two uh, permits to climb the mountain and prevented the British from, from climbing it when they wanted to. The British really felt Everest was their mountain, and it was a very difficult time for them. In 1952, there was no route or fixed road. We brought some tin rope from the villages that was all that we had then. The largest crevasses posed the biggest problem for the Swiss. Could they be spanned with only rope? There were big crevasses, very big. Some were far too wide. We also had to pull people across the ropes. First we took loads and then people. Although Sherpas had lived in the mountains for centuries, few had ever climbed on glaciers. When foreign expeditions provided them with strange new clothing and odd climbing tools like crampons and ice axes, it required some getting used to. I had never used boots, windproof jackets, or any climbing equipment before. And I damaged the clothing the first day with my crampons. The Sherpas carried tree trunks about 30 miles from the forest below to help span crevasses. Did you ever get stuck with the crampons? Just stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to lift up. <laughs> They used timbers to span these crevasses, and now we've got, on this one, three aluminum ladders that you used to paint the side of your garage lashed together with some old cord. And it's a little nerve-wracking going over this because we're 100 feet down to the bottom of this crevasse. With daring, skill, and a good sense of balance, the Swiss were the first to successfully navigate through the maze of ice. For the first time ever, men looked into the valley of the Western Coon, the gateway to the upper mountain. With the ice fall behind them, their chances of success had risen dramatically. But the Swiss would soon learn 
that the mountain deity always has the last word.